Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hey guys, it's me, Mikey, and before we get started with this week's episode, I wanted to take a quick second to announce the winners of our giveaway that we were doing uh, starting about a week and a half ago in tandem with the Suspendables podcast hosted by Jim Jerome and Russ Cortnell. Now, Jim Jerome was a guest on our podcast a few weeks ago. To celebrate that, we had a giveaway of a Sidney Crosby jersey signed and a signed Mitch Marner jersey as well. All you had to do to take part was subscribe to the Sign Off podcast, which if you're listening to this, you more than likely are, and to subscribe to the Suspendables podcast as well. Another great hockey podcast, as I mentioned, hosted by Jim Jerome and Russ Cortnell. If you are a fan of the episode with Jim Jerome, you should absolutely check out that episode as well. We had a ton of participants, so we thank everyone for for taking part. Now, to begin, the winner of the Mitch Marner jersey, signed Toronto Maple Leafs Pro 8 Adidas jersey, is... Kevin McNamara, I hope I'm getting that name right. Uh, If you're listening to this, reach out to us. Let us know you're listening. We'll arrange to get that jersey sent to you. If we don't hear from you, we will reach out as well. And the winner of the signed Sidney Crosby Pro Weight Pittsburgh Penguins jersey is Jeff Campbell. So Jeff Campbell for the Sidney Crosby jersey, Kevin McNamara for the Mitch Marner jersey. Reach out to us, or if we don't hear from you in the next couple days, we'll be reaching out to you. Thank you so much for taking part, and to everyone else who participated, hopefully you uh, had a little bit of fun, and in a worst-case scenario, you got a great consolation prize in two great podcasts you get to listen to now. So thanks once again, guys. We will see you on the other side for another great episode of the Sign Off Podcast. Hello and welcome. My name is Mikey Aaronworth, signing on to The Sign Off, a Frameworth podcast for yet another week. And uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, you will see it is a lonely room today. We are taking another break from having a guest uh, because, listen, when you have guests as good as you, Dad, Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth, why do you need to get anyone else? Uh, we're, we're going to be sitting down and talking about something that we've been asked quite a bit about, and uh, it's Frameworth's foray into the world of publishing. We had an episode earlier on that had more to do with uh, the gifting side of publishing, working with bands like U2, Madonna, Black Sabbath, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, but we also have one major public- publishing uh, kind of credit under our belts, and that is Eddie Shack's biography. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube, once again, holding up a uh, picture of that book over there, Eddie Shack, Hockey's Most Entertaining Stories with Ken Reed, with is a little bit of an understatement. Uh, Ken Reed was uh, integral in writing this book. He uh, he, uh, uh, wrote the whole thing with Eddie Shack, sat down, got all the stories, uh, did a lot of the interviews and tours as well. Um, And that's kind of the end result of the book that we have. But I want to talk more about the overall story. I mean, this book was not necessarily supposed to happen. There already existed a a biography about Eddie Shack uh, when it came time for you to pitch, Dad, the idea of putting something together. So why don't we just very generally talk in the, from the outset of why Eddie Shack and what he meant to you before you decided to move forward with something like this, like a, like a book? Well, just, just to be clear, this book was never planned. It just, right. um, just uh, much like my birth. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Lori, if you're listening. No. Um, so basically, uh, over the years, Eddie Shack um, kind of became a friend of the family. In yep. fact, uh, he had a home just down the street from my father's on Bayview Country Club, and he used to drive by in his... Did he used to live... Yeah, right I on, didn't know that. Yeah, right so the, uh, the, the, the listener wouldn't know this, but that's basically my childhood home. I didn't know that Eddie Shack lived he was essentially the, running distance away from there. He was on the 12th hole. My dad was on the putting green. So you had to pass my dad's home to get to Eddie's home. And uh, I mean, there's stories of Eddie Shack was an amazing individual. But mm-hmm. um, so so he used to drive by in his blue dune buggy mm-hmm. and stop and talk to my dad in the driveway. Just, you know, hey, Harry, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And um, they started to become friends. Now, actually, how about this? Before you get into it, there may be the odd young listener that doesn't know who Eddie Shack is. Eddie Shack was a a uh, a very famous hockey player, uh, not just for his skills on the ice. He played for several different teams, in tr- including the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, won six Stanley Cups or four Stanley, four Stanley Cups? Stanley sorry, Cups. four Stanley Cups. Uh, retired, obviously, but a a kind of a, a Wendell Clark type. Uh, but with a little bit more of a uh, of an edge, they they called him the entertainer for good reasons. Right. Uh, he was he was a very funny player on and off the ice. What most notably, you know, as as a podcast that loves talking about marketing, 
was one of the first players to sign a marketing deal, and it was for Pop Shop. You can look up yeah. those uh, those early uh, commercials. Uh, a man who who couldn't read. Uh, was was illiterate uh, and found his way not only into hockey but into the world of business uh, in a way that most other players, I'm talking like 99% of the other players of his era, could never have done for themselves. Um, so you can you can look him up and do a little bit more research on it. I, I there's a or, reason, or just buy the book or just buy the book. There you go, and we'll talk about how to get that book. It's actually currently available on Amazon. I'll show that to the camera once again. Eddie Shack, hockey's most entertaining stories with Ken Reed. So why don't you continue then? So. To- so Eddie, um, and, and you need five shows to, to cover Eddie Shack, and you still wouldn't get it done. But Eddie, Eddie would drive by, and he became friends with my father. Right. And when my father retired, um, I set up an office here at Frameworth for him, so he could, you know, basically have a escape from, you know, <laughs> hanging around the house with my grandmother. <laughs> I noticed how you decided with your to grandmother. tread carefully there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, so he'd come in every morning, and he'd help out you know, once a week with the payroll or whatever it would be. And just to give him, um, you know, something to do. And then he'd play golf every day and go leave at noon and off he'd go. Eddie came by and became friends. So when uh, Eddie lives not too far from our company here, and he started coming in the office to say hi to my dad, it's always like a 15-minute uh, ordeal where he'd right. walk into the office and sit down and just shoot the shit with dad, um, tell stories. I could hear him laughing. He, my dad at the office next door. And then he'd come and see you and he'd yeah. come and see me. Well, not but, only because because you, you mentioned the quick 15 minute ordeal in the beginning and he just came to visit uh, uh, my grandpa, your dad. Uh, and that's kind of it for the beginning. Right. Uh, it, it was just kind of this thing where, you know, people in the office were like, hey, did you know Eddie Shack is here? And he would end up coming here every day. But at that point, he was still somewhat of a stranger uh, to me. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much he would come to see you. Actually, funny story, the way in which Eddie Shack and I became close, you know, similar to the Charles Barkley story. Uh, people are going to start to think I'm an asshole, but I'm, I'm not, I promise you. Um, but I remember having an interaction with Eddie and he was in uh, my grandpa's office and they were talking about another player. I won't say the player's name and about some of the issues that Eddie and this player had, you know, dating back to whenever. And finally, you know, Eddie's sitting there and he's leaning back in his chair and I'm in there talking to my grandpa and to, uh, and to, uh, to Eddie um, without knowing him too, too well. And Eddie's sitting there just like typical Eddie, the big mustache. He's got a cowboy hat at this point with a, like a, a painting of himself on it with signed <laughs> by all the people. And he's just sitting, like larger than life personality. And Eddie's there and, and I'm like, but I just don't get it. Like you guys have enough in common, you know, like, like why, why can't you guys just, you know, get past it and, 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 and start to, to like each other again. And he's like, well, this person, He's just so full of himself. I just can't deal with it. And I'm like, Eddie, this is coming from the guy who's wearing a hat with a photo of himself on it. Like, get <laughs> over yourself. What are you talking about? And then his big uproarious laugh. And and I think it was kind of from that moment on that that he uh, he uh, kind of uh, uh, took to me a little bit. Well, you know, it's funny because um, in the in the early days when Eddie used to come and see my dad, you know, I was trying to build a business. So right. as much as I grew up in his era. Well, I was a kid. He's a little older than I am, but but I was there for the four Stanley Cups, watching religiously at the age of whatever five or six on. And uh, you know, he was almost a distraction for me because right. he'd come in, and I I just wouldn't have the time to to sit down and talk to him. I had things to do. Um, two thousand nine rolls around. My dad passes away, and Eddie was kind of lost because Eddie's retired, so he'd have his routine. He would go from our company over to Costco, right. grab himself a hot dog, sit and entertain <laughs> all the people that go by, be wearing his cowboy hat. Some yeah. people, were, everybody would recognize yeah. him, not, maybe not the kids. And the fathers would tell the kids' story. And then he would go somewhere else. He'd go to Pusa Terry's, and then he'd get some free stuff from Pusa Terry's. Yep. And he, yep. Anyways, he'd do his routine. When he was kind of lost when my dad passed away, and he, would, he never really wanted to go into hospital. So when my dad was sick yeah. and in the hospital, he didn't want to go, but he went because yeah. he loved my dad. Yeah. You know, I probably so many times in the hospital and never wanted to see another one with Eddie after all his whole, his career. Um, so he started coming in to see me, and that's when I kind of fell in love with Eddie and 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 made the time for him. Yeah. Because he had story after story after story. Stuff that uh, you know, we talk about this all the time is the inside stuff that people don't get to hear every day about right. 
what went on behind the scenes. Now, I saw everything that was on the ice. Sure. But I didn't see what was going on in the dressing room, the fights that they had between players, between coaches, uh, the issues with management. and, yep. and That's and, almost a sport in and of itself. Almost more interesting than, oh, than what happens way on more. the ice. I always, yeah. I always find that the, most of the stories people ask me about uh, for different players, the ones that are of most interest to anybody asking are the ones that are unrelated to the to the game on the yeah, ice. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's kind of the premise of the podcast, right? right. That's the, those are the types of stories we love to tell. So Eddie used to come into the office all the time and tell stories. Now, a few years back, and I'll get my dates wrong, but let's say it was uh, you know just uh, 2019, I think it was, that Eddie uh, came in and he was telling stories, and I said, you know, Eddie, one day, and they're and they're all a lot of them are the same stories told over and over again. They were ingrained in my head. I sure. said, but you got to get these down in in some kind of form. He said, give well, us, give us an example of one of the stories. Give it, give us maybe maybe one uh, uh, that that used to stick out to you. One one that he would tell you every week, but that you looked forward to hearing regardless. Well, a lot of the jokes and things that he would tell. Uh, and they were pretty off color jokes, you know, yeah. elephant in the room is, is Eddie was notoriously a, uh, 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 a very, Oh, how to put it. Um, he, he went to the beat of his own drum. He, he was very politically incorrect and that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, especially in the modern day. But he was one of those almost grandfathered in characters who could get away with a lot because I think at his core, he was a, a just a very good person. Um, but yeah, do you have any specific Well, I mean, there? there's story after story, but okay. he, he would tell about how he came to Toronto because Red Kelly refused a trade. Um, so he was supposed to go to, uh, if I forget how it goes, but he was supposed to uh, uh, go to Detroit, but Red Kelly wouldn't go make the trade. So anyways, and, and I'll get the story straight because it's been a while since I've I've heard it, but he goes back and says, well, because Red Kelly refused the trade, I got traded to Toronto. He, right. he hated the coach. Oh, so here's a good story. So the coach <laughs> in, in New York, um, he, he didn't like very much. And so they were having a bad streak in New York. And he said to the – so the coach had a team meeting. And he said, whatever you guys want to do, uh, I want to have a meeting, and you can say whatever you want. You won't it won't be held against you. We just need to clear up this mess. Risky thing to say when Eddie Shack is in the room. <laughs> so everybody's well. We got to play harder, coach. Uh, you know, we you know we're not playing tough enough. And Eddie Eddie just came out and said what it was on his mind, which was something to the effect, "Well, you know, you don't know. You're not playing your best players. You're not doing." He was very critical of the coach. Yeah. Uh, within a couple of weeks, he got sent down to the minors. Oh, it was a trap. It so, was a trap. Um, when, you're, when your uh, coaches, mentors, parents are asking you for the truth, uh, treat that with, uh, with a little grain of salt. They may, maybe it's going to come back and haunt you. Who All knows? the stories, I mean, how he used to carry hockey sticks in the back of his car in case the police pulled him over. <laughs> And then they would get a signed stick and, and uh, you know, to let him off the ticket of whatever it would be. That reminds me of the story we had uh, uh, Wendell Clark in here not too long ago. And he told the story about, uh, you know, I, I just kind of floated the question of, you know, being a superstar in Toronto, were there any benefits? And he said, uh, he said, well, I won't say that there were any benefits, but I'll say this. The first time I got a traffic ticket was a week after I was traded to Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the funny thing. He... Uh, uh, so Eddie, Eddie was sitting in my office and I said, you got to get this down in writing. And he said, well, I've already done a book. And I said, yeah, that was 10, 20 years ago. And I said, you know, you got to stay relevant. And he said, well, I'm, I'm all for it. Let's do it. Yeah. And I said, well, um, I don't write books, but I I'll, I'll finance and publish it. I don't know. I mean, I've done books before, but they were all pre-sold to live nation. Sure. Like the gifting books that yeah, we talked about yeah. in an earlier episode, yeah. But I said, I don't know much about it, but I'll figure that out. Uh, but we need somebody to write it. And then I thought about, I just uh, talked to a good friend of mine who was on the podcast before, Ken Reed. Right. And episode I phoned two. him up and I said, uh, you interested in writing a book about Eddie Shack? He wants to do a book. And he said, I'm in yeah. immediately. Yeah. Didn't ask about money, didn't ask about anything. He just says, I'm in, I'm, I want to do this book. And so Ken was in. And he said, well, when do you think you'd want to launch it? And I think this was in April. And I said, well, I think we it should be good for a Christmas launch. And he said, so Christmas of the following year. Yeah. I said, no, Christmas of this year. Yeah. I said, Brian, it's April. We haven't started. <laughs> he says, you have no idea because Ken's published 
three or four books anyways. He says, it'll take a year and a half to get into the into play. I said, no, no, I don't want to wait that long. We're going to launch it in November. Can you do it? He says, if, if you think you can publish it, I'll do my best to write it. I got to clear the slate of other things that I'm doing. I said, okay. So we get, we get Ken to start writing the book. I, I think it's important to note that one of the only reasons he agreed to a timeline this significant I, yep. was because of his respect and love for Eddie Shack, yep. knowing the stories that he was going to get to tell. Eddie has, well, he, we'll, we'll go into some of that, but the bottom line was we decided to do the book. We set the target goal for November. Uh, I had Richard McCork, who was a, a good friend of mine, an amazing um, uh, creative layout that he did. He, he designed the concept of the book, which is co- cross between a coffee table mm-hmm. book and a, and, and a, and a story of, of Eddie's yep. career. And so it's a really good combination. And, and uh, uh, Richard came up with the concept of having Eddie tell a story. And then it, you know, sometimes his recollection wasn't that good. Um, you, you know, he's getting up in age. So we'd ask his wife. And, and so there were little sticky notes on different stories. Like it would look like a sticky note sure. that was printed on the page. What Norma said, Norma right. being his wife. And she would say, no, Eddie, Eddie yeah. was, uh, he, he saw it that way, but it was totally wrong. And, and so she would correct wherever Eddie went off track. And that was, that was a great, uh, oh, clear the track. Yeah, there yeah, goes Shaq. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 the best way to put that is like, if you, uh, if you've ever seen pop-up video, like the old, uh, much music or MTV thing where, you know, something is happening and you get a little pop-up and it's like, well, actually the way that this was filmed was blah, blah, blah. Right. Cause Eddie starts to like the movie, big fish, just kind of reimagine the stories right. in his own head. So it was, it's a really neat, uh, uh, method of clarifying what could have been hyperbole and is instead just Norma bringing things back down to earth and saying, no, no, no. He thought this is what happened. This is kind of how it happened. And Norma, uh, a, 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 an incredible, incredibly significant person with regards to uh, the NHL and especially relations players uh, to yep. the league uh, in her own right. We should, we'll have her on in, in yes. a future episode, uh, uh, Eddie's wife, but uh, she's done an incredible amount for player relations within the yeah, NHL, the as NHL well. alumni. Yeah. She was part of the whole lawsuit going back. But um, so, so when we decided to get the book done at, uh, Ken did numerous interviews, and then we did a lot of research into photos. We went through Eddie's photo albums and tried to find unique photos from his career going right back to junior hockey um, and, and how he was an entrepreneur back then. The big thing about Eddie was he couldn't, he, he was illiterate, and he used to brag about it. Yeah. I'm illiterate, he used <laughs> to say. I'm illiterate. Um, I can't read or write, but, you know, he, he found a way to get by, and at the end of his life, he was a very wealthy man. Yes. And not from hockey. It was just about his skill set and how he, his investments, and he got taken advantage of in a lot of those investments. Yes. I think it's, it's worth clarifying that most of his nest egg began because of his hockey career but he was able to turn that into much more. Most of the money he made was as a result of owning a golf course or being a part owner in a golf course. Uh, but but it's it's important also to say that that even past his playing days, he was very good at leveraging his celebrity to broker new deals. He was one of the first to do that. Yeah. Eddie had a personality bigger than life. And so he wore the cowboy hat, which which began in, when he was at um, Biltmore, which was a cowboy a hat company or a hat company um, and paid him to, to wear the hat around. So right. that's when he started wearing then the cowboy boots. And I think we have a game used cowboy ho- boots that Eddie wanted yes. to sell at some point. I didn't even, I forgot he gave them to me. I found them the other day in inventory where he signed his cowboy boots. His game used game. He kept saying game used. Game Eddie, used. what game did you wear these boots in? You wore them dancing and you want to sell those with your signature on he it. He even had a pair of cleats that are, are a pair of boots that he put, golf cleats on so he could wear them around the golf course <laughs> it's <was> crazy <laughs> crazy and he was a member up at devil's pulpit he had his own golf course anyways so many of those stories but the interesting part about the book was that i think the most fun i had was we did manage to bring it out in november right and it, it was exceptional um and then the tour started as i didn't know anything about marketing book i phoned 
um, different book companies like uh, Barnes and Noble right. and Indigo. And I had a great conversation with Indigo. And he said, Brian, the, the buyer said, you realize that, you know, we, we never bring out a book in November that you try and sell me in September. Right, exactly. Um, it would be like selling, like if there's a, a, many people might not know this, but anytime you see a, a Father's Day sale at, at a, 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 like a big box retailer, that was essentially decided eight months ago, right. minimum. Usually you book one year for the following year. So especially for something like a book. That's, well, Barnes that's and awful. Noble said, laughed at. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I got a... a, a fellow on the phone at Indigo who was a hockey fan understood that there was great potential there. Um, almost sight unseen, he decided to take the books in store. And then I said, okay, I'm going to, the one thing I can support you with is Eddie wants to go on tour. Right. Like he wants to be, this is, this is bringing him back to life because he was such a, a big icon for many, for sure. many years. And he was kind of falling out of limelight with new players coming in and all that. So we, I started arranging a tour and Ken Reed, Help me, you know, with Rogers, and we were on all sorts of hockey at noon and uh, uh, different shows there. We one day, so think, he, didn't you do like breakfast television? And here, things like here's that? a typical day, and this is Eddie at the age of what was he then? Close to eighty. Yeah. Um, we started the day at. I picked him up at four thirty in the morning mm -hmm. to go to breakfast television, and we got there in the green room, and. Eddie was having a coffee and uh, he was ready to go. Uh, they put him on breakfast television. I just watched the show the other day because I taped it. Oh, and, nice. And uh, he lit up the room. Yeah. Sat on the couch with the hosts and just went to town and laughed and told stories. And then we th th that segment of the show is over. He gets off the and I'm standing there with them. And then the next se segment starts about something happening in Africa or whatever. And they're discussing wildlife. And Eddie walks right on the set <laughs> on camera. And then the, the host of that segment started laughing and, and invited him to sit in on that. And then he started, and they all wanted photos with them. Yeah. So that was the day, that's a start. From there, we head up to, uh, we head up to Rogers and we do an interview in the morning with uh, Jeff Rahoman. Yeah. Um, and then that was a segment. And then we did uh, Hockey Central. And then we did, um, then we went over to my son's restaurant for lunch at Pig Out Barbecue, Chris. Uh, over at uh, Spadina and Harbor in right. Toronto, best barbecue and then, in the city. Yeah, it's great food. And Eddie loved it. And he entertained there, signed autographs for everybody in the restaurant. And then we went back to Rogers, did a show in, at, in the afternoon with... Um, uh, Stephen Brunt, I think it was, or, uh, and this is all in one day. Wait, th this is it. I drive him home and say, Eddie, I've got a, um, uh, yeah, I got, I, I go back to the office, uh, because we don't have to, we have to be at, uh, Maple Leaf sports and entertainment at real sport to do an autograph signing there in the building before the hockey oh game. Oh my God. Night. And that's at five 30. So, I go back to the office. Which is, which is about the time I'm waking up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm back. So now I pick him up. We go downtown at about 4 o'clock. Uh, we're a little early. So we go into Real Sports Bar across the street. He wants a glass of wine, get a quick bite to eat. And, of course, now he's talking to everybody, signing autographs. It's before a Leaf game, so right. everybody in there is right. Leaf fans. And we're sitting at the bar having a great time. Then I take him in. He does an autograph signing. It was supposed to be prior to the game in in the uh, what was the ACC at the time, I believe, and uh, line up signing books, kissing kids, hugging babies, doing the whole thing. <laughs> uh, Wouldn't kiss the babies; you'd only hug them. Right, <laughs> one or the other. Uh, anyway, so he he does that. Then they say, "Well, you know, we couldn't do it because the game was starting." So he said, well, "Okay, we'll come back at the end of the first period." Sure. We go up to the alumni box. Bob Nevins up there at the time. Uh, we're we're having a great time up there. Back to sign autographs in the second period, in the in the first intermission, um, and then we had finished. So I said, "Would you want to watch the rest of the game?" We watched another period up in the alumni box. Actually, watch the rest of the game. Come back, and I'm driving them home. It's now ten thirty at night. I I can't keep my eyes open. Yeah, Eddie is in the driveway, and he's insisting I come in for a glass of wine. <laughs> I, I did refuse. I said, Eddie, I can't do this anymore. We did this every day for a month. 
It, the craziest part about it is I remember, uh, you know, I was working full time at, at Frameworth at the time and uh, seeing you come and go in the office and you looked exhausted, exhausted because the schedule, you know, it wasn't just here. You'd be flying out to the East Coast to do some some tours oh, and signings over there, story. Uh, which, yeah, I want you to, to tell that one in a second. But the reason why it's crazy is because you were this exhausted and Eddie is what, 15 years Older, yeah, 20 well, years yeah. old, something, something along yeah, those lines. 15, yeah. Um, and he, it just felt like he was having such a great time that fatigue wasn't a factor or something like that. He just, it was, it wasn't work to him. Whereas, you know, I know you probably enjoyed it touring for your first oh, book I that you had it, published. But it was work. But it was, it was work. It was exhausting. This was Eddie being Eddie in the most Eddie fashion you could imagine. Well, Eddie and I were very close, uh, and, and you know we just, we knew about each other's families. We knew each other, but the good things, the bad things. We had a lot of time to talk. But when Eddie, um, when you're driving around with Eddie, he can he was a tough guy. Like he thought a different way, right? So you, you weren't going to convince him not to do it his way, right? So, but but some of the fun things that happened in and amongst the the things that were drove me crazy. <laughs> I took him out to the East Coast. Yes. And we did um we did a, a number of autograph signings there with a good friend of mine, Brad Hartland, had a number of bars and restaurants out mm -hmm. there. So we did that tour. We did C B C East Coast in the morning first thing. We um their, their morning show. Uh and then but but getting into the Toronto airport. Yeah. So Eddie Eddie was not shy about anything. Um, Eddie had prostate problems when he was younger, um, and he had to wear, this is Eddie's marketing. He had to wear, uh, uh, adult diapers, um, when he was traveling around. Uh, and he would say, and he said to me, came into my office one day, he says, you know, I got a great idea. I said, what's that? He says, well, everybody's ashamed, you know, when they get, they're embarrassed as adult, they got to put these adult diapers on. Right. He says, let's do a commercial. Yeah. Let's you phone up one of the diaper companies and you tell them I'm going to stand there in my diaper, my cowboy <laughs> boot, and my cowboy hat. And I'll say, I'm Eddie Shack and I I love these diapers. And he, he had the whole script all yeah. laid out. Yeah. Now he couldn't read the cue cards, he, he'd <laughs> ad lib, but he it was a great idea. And Fantastic. I unfortunately never got around to doing it, but that would have been a home run. Can you imagine well, him? I'm glad you brought it up because it would almost feel, I think, to some listeners that when you mention, because I know you're, you're getting into a story with this, but you mentioned that he was in adult diapers. It, it may seem to some listeners like we're uh, telling tales out of school or something like that. But and he, he wasn't was embarrassed about anything. 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 No. A very, very honest and open person. Yeah. So then we get, so the first thing we get into the car, I, I get him into the airport. We're walking in the front door. He said, get me a wheelchair. I said, okay. I mean, he's capable of walking. No, no, that'll get us around faster. It'll get us through places quicker. Right. Now, he did right. have a hard time walking. Right. His, you know, his, <laughs> his feet were pretty his bad. His knees were rough, yeah. too. He had, I think, and, two knee surgeries. Uh, okay. That, and he had some bad problems yeah. with his feet at the time. So we put him in the wheelchair, and he, we're, I'm re wheeling him to the gate, uh, or just to get into security, and he's talking to everybody. How you doing? How you? And people, hey, there's Eddie Shock. He, like he made sure everybody yeah. saw him, acknowledged him, and said hello to everybody. For sure. And we get to the gate and everybody was a sweet. He's an old school guy. Politically correct is not one of his no. best features. No. But he'd be talking to the uh, security people. Hey, sweetheart, how you doing? <laughs> I got to, you know, I, I got to get through here and. We got escorted right. I've never been through security so fast. <laughs> and it was all him. I'm pushing him around. And, and we get him on the plane. Um, it, it was just a great experience. We land in Halifax. I start the whole routine. Uh, went from place to place. And one of the uh, afternoon signings. So we did this long day. And then about 4 o'clock, we we're supposed to be at a Rogers communication store. Yeah. Where they sell uh, in, a, in Phones kind of a, and an outdoor mall yeah, downtown yeah. Halifax. And Eddie comes in there and it was one of the few places that I don't think they promoted it very well, but there was one of the few places that didn't have anybody like there's one guy yeah. waiting. So I don't think maybe they put up a sign and that was it. Eddie sat there for about 10 minutes and I had to get on a conference call with my, uh, with somebody in San Francisco. So I turned my back on him. And the next thing I know, I said, where'd Eddie go? And the store manager said, 
uh, he left. I said, Where, <laughs> what do you mean he left? He's supposed to be here for an hour. <laughs> and he says, I know. He says, what if somebody comes in? And I, I said, where did he go? He says, well, across the way. It was an outdoor mall, and across the way there was a restaurant, and you could see the bar inside. Yeah, yeah. And there was Eddie sitting at the bar drinking a glass of red wine. Uh, yeah, okay. So I went I went over there, and I said, Eddie, we, they paid us to come in here. They bought so many books so that you could do the signing. He said, I don't care. He says, that's an embarrassment. They didn't do the marketing. I'm not sitting in that store, an empty store. He says, tell them if there's somebody who wants a book signed, come <laughs> over here and I'll buy them a glass of wine and we'll talk stories. And so we sat there and ate oysters and drank red wine. And, and then um, uh, the store manager understood. And then next thing you know, we had to go to the Moosehead game, the Halifax Moosehead this game. Is, this is after the afternoon. After that. Now, it's, it's, it, before we get to the Moosehead game, I, I do want to mention, like, it, you know, that, to that story, it may seem like Eddie's just being difficult. But, you know, he was a, he was a prideful guy. Uh, you know, yeah. he was the entertainer. And ultimately, I think you'll probably agree the reason he didn't want to sit there wasn't because he just was tired or fed up. It was kind of embarrassing to, oh, to no, sit down and have, and have no one and, there. And he was right. Yeah. If the store didn't do the job to promote him, then it's it's a slap in the face to him right. making a look like, you know, he's not popular. Sure. Because I'll tell you what, the next thing when we went to the Moosehead game, he didn't stop signing autographs the whole game. He had a lineups for people. And, and, and again, the red wine in the coffee cup. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like, Brian. Get me into red. He loved his red wine. Yes. And um, so we spent the rest of the day there and then, of course, went back to the hotel. And, and so it, not only was it moving him around, but trying to keep up with him. Oh, know, fair. Especially when I wasn't doing the chauffeuring. Then, then I had no reason not, <laughs> to, to, not to drink Yeah, with you him. can have a red yeah, wine too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I, I, those stories out in the East Coast, I was jealous of. I, I went to school out in Halifax, you know this, yeah. uh, and, uh, and I, 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 I miss that city quite a bit. The Mooseheads games were always a lot of fun. Great fans and a great atmosphere out there as well. Um, you know, you, you talk about chauffeuring. One, just a little uh, palate cleanser of a story before we get into the book itself. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, because he was coming to our office so much, I would often see him driving his car around the area. And I got out of a Tim Hortons and I was waiting at a red light right behind his car, waiting to turn left. And you talk about, you know, going to the beat of your own drum. He just didn't see a reason to do things unless there was a specific justification for it. Red light, no cars coming either way drives straight through the intersection, makes a left turn. I was just baffled. You just don't see that very often. And I, I saw him in frameworks. I was like, Eddie, did you realize you ran a red light? He's like, ah, there were no cars coming for miles. What? And, you know, I sit back and I think about it, not that I'm advocating for running a red light <laughs> ever, uh, but it was it kind of made sense. Like, there was no cars ever, no repercussions. He made his way through, and that that is kind of a... Uh, a uh, 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 you know, a, a microcosm of what Betty Shack's life is. You know, it doesn't matter what the rules are. He's going to do it the way he wants to do it. And and that that got him to where he was. Some of the unique things about the book. Um, so I was up north at, at uh, my cottage and one of the my friends up there had said, you know, I told him we we're writing the book and he says, oh boy, do I have a Eddie Shack, great story for Eddie Shack. And I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, I I was going, this is back in the day and not advocating drinking and driving and yeah. all that stuff at all. But and unfortunately it was done back then, but it did create some interesting stories. So he says, I was going into the a place. It was a popular bar back in the eighties and nineties. He said, uh, the chicken deli. Oh, I remember that bar. Yeah. Right. They used to have great trivia there. You're right. <laughs> young, and they had bands there. And, and a lot of the players, the old timers used to go, Bob Nevin was frequently seen there and Eddie Shack would go in because uh, um, Carl Brewer, who was a Maple Leaf mm -hmm. back, a great Maple Leaf, his brother Jack owned the bar. Oh, so it's kind that of a, makes sense. Because I remember there was this thing where Eric Lindros every so often would be spotted there as well. It was like, you know, the, because of the history of the, of the, of Carl and all sure. the ex-leaves. So Eddie, so my friend Steve, he goes, uh, he's getting out of his car, uh, parking on the street there, uh, Mount Pleasant, and all of a sudden he sees Eddie come walking across the street. And Eddie, uh, as is documented in the book, one of his businesses after hockey was selling Christmas trees. Yes. So he had a pickup truck with the Christmas tree hanging out the back. The, the stump of the tree was yeah. going backward. 
And Eddie had, as my friend tells it, Eddie backed up his car. The Christmas tree went right through the radiator <laughs> of, of a car on the street behind him. And then he just took off. No. I, now, I can't imagine him not knowing he hit the car, yeah. but he just took off. So, Eddie, so my friend looks at it and he says, Oh my God, that was Eddie Shack. And he says, Maybe I should call the police. It's kind of like he did some damage to that car. Maybe he knew about it. Maybe he didn't. But and then he said, "Nah, it's Eddie Shack," <laughs> and he and he laughed. See, so, here's here's the thing about Eddie is that is a horrifying story for like objective for the guy that owned the car, the especially. That, no, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Eddie would do such outrageous things and was so beloved by so many people. You can almost envision a situation where the guy gets out to his car and says. Eddie Shack dropped a tree on my car and is like kind of okay with it because of that. Like, like is a tree off. The funniest thing about Eddie Shack, you mentioned the Christmas trees and there, there is some of uh, that about uh, in, in the book and we'll get to the book uh, in just a second here. But the number of times Eddie Shack comes up in conversation, it's basically 50, 50, whether people are going to say I loved watching him play or my dad loved watching him play or the other 50% chance is our family bought a Christmas tree from him one year. Like that is, it's like he was a, almost had a monopoly on Christmas trees. Everyone wanted to like, look, if you're going to get one, why not get one from Eddie Shack? That was kind of his premise and it worked. And the way that all evolved was Eddie went up north, talked to the guy, he'd buy all the trees. Then he'd arrange a, a place at, in some uh, parking lot of a big shopping mall, like at Bayview and Shepherd. And he'd set up there. And they'd let him do it for free because yeah. it was Eddie Shack. And then he'd pay the guys and he'd send them inside for coffees and that. And Eddie would be there selling the trees. Yeah. In fact, he sold me one that I never even put up. I didn't even <laughs> want it. But he sold it for our bar Gardunis across the street from Maple Leaf Gardens. And he convinced me to buy this 12-foot tree. And we, it just leaned in the corner for the whole winter. because. But I couldn't say no to Eddie. He was that good a salesman. That's amazing. Um, but, you know, Eddie, Eddie... The other side of the book that's really interesting is I have a lot of friends in the hockey business uh, and I would phone around and say, look, we're writing this book. So oh, the, the reason I told the story before I get on to that with, with, with Steve's story was when Steve told me that story, I thought, what a great idea. I'm sure there's people out there. Right, that have... Steve is the guy who told you the story about the tree. Steve the Francisco, yeah. yeah he, he was uh, a friend of mine from up at the island. So when... He told me that story. I thought, what a great idea. We're, we should run a contest for people that have stories like that because I'm sure he's touched all, so many sure, people. Sure, And so we did. And we had we were inundated with great stories. Yeah. And we picked 10 of them and we put those stories in the book. That's fantastic. And one of them came from a guy that I know, Fraser Neek, who, who um, I think uh, was reiterating a story I told him about how Eddie, we had a big event here with Wayne Gretzky. right. And Eddie was in the audience uh, as a guest of mine. And he sat there and we had a Q&A at the end. And Eddie uh, Eddie put his hand up and Wayne looks out and says, <laughs> I recognize that. that that's Eddie Shack. <laughs> and Eddie says, that's uh, the guy who wears the adult diapers. Right. <laughs> Eddie says, you know, uh, he says, Eddie, do you have a question? He says, yeah, Wayne. He says, I just want to know, um, how many Stanley Cups have you won? <laughs> and, and Wayne goes, well, I've won four. And Eddie says, so have I. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. So anyway, oh, it's so, amazing. Um, so that was one of the stories that Fraser put in. So we had 10 stories and each one of those got an autographed book as a thank you. Yeah. And they were published in the book. And the other thing that happened was I had phoned around to various people or talked about the book. And I said to some of the players that I know, um, would you mind, you know, telling a story about Eddie for the book? Right. And nobody said no. I asked. I, we, we had so many, I couldn't put them all in. But we did manage to get some of the best ones. Not the best ones, but some of... Okay, so Wayne Gretzky wrote yep. a story for the book. Yeah. Um, uh, Bernie Perron, who was our guest last week, yep. wrote a story for the book. Frank Mahovlich, George Armstrong, Bobby Hall was good friends with Wayne, or with, uh, with Eddie. Eddie. And so they had little, neat little stories that, that they told about yep. Eddie behind the scenes. Now, uh, speaking of stories about Eddie uh, that made it to the book, uh, you as the publisher actually wrote a two-page introduction, essentially a foreword to the book. Now, 
Was that always part of the plan or did that come along the way? When did you decide that you wanted to rightfully so insert yourself into the narrative of, of Eddie's book well, and, and what were, what was your thinking behind what you wanted to accomplish by doing that? Well, I wanted my picture in the book. <laughs> I'm even taking flack from my daughter, Nicole, because she's the only family member, I think, that didn't we didn't manage to get a picture in there, and that's an oversight. <laughs> so we, we had a couple of um, events here with Eddie. No, the reason I wrote the foreword was uh, he was such a special guy to me, and I wanted to tell everybody how, how this book came about, which I've kind of told everybody here now. It, it just came about out of nowhere. Um. You know, really, to the, the, the most interesting thing about it or, or the most important thing about it was everybody, including Ken Reed's publisher uh, for his books, said, Brian, you're, it's ridiculous. You're never going to be able to get a book out there yes. in time. And I said, we, I, I, there was something about it. I said, I'm not one to, to, to procrastinate. For, We're for gonna- better or worse, uh, anyone who's worked for you knows this as well. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's exhausting, but, t- you know, without fail, Whatever the goal that's been set is reached. It, it, there's it, a way to do it. And so Ken agreed. Eddie agreed. We all devoted ourselves. We had great work by um, Richard McCorkle, as I mentioned, uh, the Ultimate Leaf fan, um, uh, Mike Wilson, and uh, Paul Passo. Um, assist. Anybody I knew that could contribute all decided they would help out. We got the book done. We got it in the stores. And I knew that a bestseller sports book in Canada – is 5,000 units. Right. And I knew without any stores at all that I could do 5,000 books out of the trunk of my car as long as Eddie was willing to do it with me. Yeah, yeah. Because he will sell the books. Uh, Indigo helped a lot, uh, and we have it on Amazon as well. But Eddie and I sold books everywhere we went. I flew him down to Philadelphia to do the podcast Spit and Chicklets. Right. And they loved them. Right. That's that's a huge one that we didn't... I mean, Spit and Chicklets, obviously an enormous podcast, but they have uh, an episode in their collection that was done as a, as a as part of the tour. And Eddie didn't know who Spit and Chicklets. Well, he doesn't follow podcasts, <laughs> but, but he had a great time with them. We flew down to Philadelphia and back in one day. Yeah. So that was another day. But... The beauty of getting this thing done, we went on tour for the month of end of the November all through December, and then we were going to pick it back up in January, and Eddie got diagnosed with cancer. Right, right. Uh, so he had throat cancer, and they went through treatments, and then he had all sorts of issues where he fell, and then he was hospitalized, and and I even heard stories about how he had days to live, and, and I got really... A few times. Yeah, I got really upset with that because, you know, people are rush so hard to to be the first to break news, even if it's not accurate. Well, you're, I think you're referring specifically to a tweet that went kind of viral. Right. Uh, that you, through Frameworth's Twitter account, replied to, to essentially set the record straight, because this was months before... Uh, Eddie had passed away, and it was essentially uh, almost an obituary notice that, right. from, from the, the person. And, who and Eddie this. was in pretty rough shape at one point, but he rebounded. Right, right. But, you know, it was like Eddie's very close to passing away, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and I just thought, boy, you know, that's not fair. Yeah. Um, and it was a very well respected sports writer and, and, and a good one. Um, he just jumped the gun a little bit. And I talked to Ken Reed about it as well. And he said, you know, everybody in, in our business needs to, you know, is trying to get the first, you know, to break the news. Right. So that that was all fine. We got that straightened away. And then he passed away. I think it was in July. Um, and it's unfortunate because he couldn't have the the fanfare, the funeral that he deserved, et cetera. Well, oh, that that is definitely unfortunate. However... I think the silver lining is that, you know, everyone always talks about the biggest celebration you're ever thrown is at your funeral, but you don't get to experience that. Right. He didn't know what was coming. No one knew it was coming, but that almost makes this tour that much more special. It, yeah, I get emotional when I think about it because, um, we spent a month together just prior to him getting sick. Right. Right. And virtually every day, um, some were very trying for me. Yep. I'm trying to run a business and be with Eddie. And, he, you know, there was times where he got a little grumpy and tired sure. and I got a little grumpy and tired. But for the most part, spending a month with Eddie, hearing the same stories and new ones, 
and then talking to his wife Norma and and being part of it with Richard and uh, McCorkle who designed the book and and uh, Ken Reed who wrote the book, spending all that time. But Eddie was front and center in the limelight. Right. He was back to being on stage, um, the number one guy. Yeah. And that was just before he passed. He never would have had that opportunity. And if it wasn't for me saying, we're doing this in November, instead of the following November, the book never would have been done. Well, that is that is one of those things that you, you never could have known when you planned it. No. But it is true. Had you not forced the, the elephant in the room that we're kind of dancing around is the fact that Eddie would have passed away before yeah. we could have finished the book. Right. And once... Even, even let's, you know, never mind finishing the book. I think for him, the most important thing was the tour. And, you know, yes, the book exists, that's fine, but he's illiterate, he's not going to read it, right? Like, that's that was never the point. The point was for him to have a resurgence in the public eye and to be able to go on this tour and to be the entertainer again, which even had we been able to publish the book, you know, we, we realize he's sick, okay, Eddie, let's get these stories onto paper, let's publish it. There's no way he was going to be doing the, the, the tour had had we been right. a couple months later. Not to mention, COVID happened oh. immediately after. The most important thing about this book was not that it it was published. Um, that that was great, and it exists, and everybody's so proud of it. The most important thing for me was to put Eddie back on on that stage that he was in for so many years, where people had kind of he he faded off a little bit. Uh, and then he was back there front and center doing his shtick, and it was amazing to watch. People loved him. A whole new generation of people found out about him because you couldn't miss it. He'd yeah. be in an indigo store. He'd be at a hockey game. and would be on kids TV. Would, he'd be on. The kids are going, who is that guy? Yes. And why is everybody crowding around him? Yeah. He had a smile on his face the whole time. He was so gracious with everybody. And so that's the most important thing. Second most important thing was we have a bestseller. That's yeah. Eddie Eddie's book sold over six thousand copies. Yep. Um, and and that makes me feel pretty proud uh, of the accomplishment that we had. But more important than all that was just the time I spent with Eddie. And and for him, you know, getting back into the entertainer on the first page, right next to the introduction, you have a quote from him. I'm the entertainer. I'm the entertainer of the century. I'm uh, holding that up in front of the camera if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, he got to be the entertainer, entertainer once again uh, before uh, you know everything kind of shut down uh, with COVID, and and he was uh, uh, experiencing some sicknesses as well. But um, with that, I think we we should start tapering off. But I, I, I I'm wondering is there is there a favorite story you have from the book? One one that. Uh, uh, say you have to pitch the sale of this book to someone and you say, there are lots of stories like X. What's one that you can pick? If you if you need time to think of one, I have one that I okay, love. Okay, go ahead. You tell me. I mean, there's so many. I'm just, I'm blanking out. I mean, I, I'm just uh, amazed at the things that he did and said. But this is, the, no, it's like, it's like Netflix syndrome where the hardest thing to do is decide to watch one thing because you have a million different <laughs> options. Um, I, I, my favorite story though, that Eddie Shack has ever told me, I've told this before on the podcast, uh, but in a different context, Eddie and Gordie Howe had quite a rivalry. I mean, there's no question Gordie Howe, better goal score, uh, better remembered in terms of his, his overall play in the NHL, but on the ice, their physical rivalry was, was notorious. And, you know, as is the case with a lot of players in the league, they uh, went uh, and, and became friends off the ice. You know, whatever happened on the ice stayed on the ice, and that was fine. He was on vacation with Gordie Howe, and they were drinking beer all day. I can't remember where they were, but they started to get into it a little bit and and started talking about their rivalry and how dangerous it was becoming for the both of them. And Gordie Howe extended the olive branch and said to Eddie... Listen, let's make a deal. You don't hit me anymore. You don't run me anymore on the ice. And I won't run you anymore on the ice. And that's not to say that they couldn't, you know, play rough against one another. But there was no more hitting with an intent to hurt. Uh, And he says, Eddie swears, from that moment on, they didn't run each other. And there was a moment where Eddie could have and chose not to specifically because of that conversation. That idea of brokering a deal outside of the hockey rink and bringing it to your day-to-day play was fascinating to me. Well, he he used to talk about how he knocked out 
uh, Gordy Howe. Yes. He knocked out. He knocked out Stan Makita. He, yeah. He he list all the guys that he'd knock out. Um, but one of it, my favorite, the one story that you hear the most of, because he'd sing it as he comes in the door, is clear the track. Here yes. comes Shaq. Yeah. Um, it, it was like. You'd hear him come down the hall and clear the track. Here comes Shaq. <laughs> it was a number one hit on the Chum Hit Parade back in the seventies. Yeah, which would be kind of like our Billboard top. Right. Yeah. A Chum Hit Parade was like what we all listened to when the Beatles came out, and you'd see how long it lasted as number one. And it was based on sales and popularity. I don't know how they did it, but you'd go to the, you go to Sam the Record Man and get yep. your Chum chart. And they wrote a song uh, about uh, clear the track. Here comes Shaq. And it was number one yep. for, for a number of weeks. And and he'd sing it. But then when he'd come in, he'd say, yeah, it was number one until you know who, <laughs> who knocked me off that list. And I, you know, I knew. And he, But he'd tell everybody, he says, Nancy Sinatra, these boots are made for walking. Knock me off the list. Isn't that great? Ha, ha, hey, ha. If there's a song to knock you off the list, Nancy Sinatra's these boots are made for walking. And in Eddie Shack's case, these cowboy boots were made for, for walking <laughs> and for selling, apparently, according to him, as long as they were signed, they were game used. Uh, I love that story. There are so many good ones in there. Uh, one last one that I, I want to tell, because we are running short on time, but this is a story that makes me laugh every time. We've mentioned before, Eddie was illiterate, couldn't read, couldn't write. Although he was good at signing his name, he could do that. But if you wanted him to sign your Beautiful name, you had to signature. you had to to write down what he did, and he almost wrote it down as as symbols. But he was on the ice, and he was getting chirped from, by the other team for not being able to read or write. Oh, Eddie, you can't read, you idiot! Like get off the ice, this and that. Game goes to overtime. Eddie Shack gets a pass, scores the goal, skates by the opposing bench, and says G O A L goal. <laughs> I love that. I love that story. And one of Eddie's fun, well, one time line is very, uh, well, it's not, I mean, it's a little off color, but uh, he was proud of the fact he came from Sudbury. Oh, yes. And he says, I come from Sudbury. He says, only hockey players and hookers come from Sudbury. <laughs> Which team did your mother play for? <laughs> It's, and he tell now I've heard that joke a thousand times, but yeah. whenever I think of it, it's still funny. The one thing I will say about the book is there are some amazing, it's an easy read, yes. great stories, uh, off color, behind the scenes stories, what happened uh, in the dressing room, what happened when they were on the road, yep. his pop shop, all those stories are in there. Um, it sounds like we're trying to sell the book. We're actually, I don't even know how many copies there are left because I'm not probably going to do a second publishing, but... So well, they're available can, on Amazon if you want to check them out. you can find it. Eddie Shack, Hockey's Most Entertaining Stories. I'll hold that up to the camera once again. It is available. Uh, I believe it's also available on Frameworth's website, frameworth.com, if you wanted to go get it. Uh, but as you mentioned, this is not... Uh, an attempt to sell the book. There aren't very many copies left. We just wanted to have an episode dedicated to Eddie and to sort of outline the absurdity that surrounded the publishing and the touring of this book. This whirlwind tour right. uh, was was very impressive. Uh, we will, I'll lead off with a quote that Eddie loved, uh, and I think everyone can take this one to heart. We talked about how he could be a little bit off color, how he could be a little bit politically incorrect uh, at times, but uh, Eddie would go out always saying, don't behave yourself, be yourself. Right. And I think everyone can take uh, a little bit of that uh, within reason, but uh, no one did it better than Eddie Shack. So, yeah. uh, Eddie, uh, thanks again for everything, wherever you are. Um, miss you, of Here's course. Here's Eddie. Yeah, good friend. Um, so thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Mike Aaronworth. With me, as always, Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth. And this is us signing off. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we made it to the end of yet another episode. Thanks again so much for joining us. You can find videos of all of our episodes on YouTube by searching the Sign Off Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Frameworth Sport or Instagram at Frameworth Sports. And hey, if you're not sick of me yet, you can find me on Twitter over at, at Retrograde Mikey, or you can always find me embarrassing myself over on Instagram at Aaronworth. The Sign Off is a proud product of Fadu Productions and Sad Styles Productions, executive producers Mikey Aaronworth and Andrew Bascom. Until next week, this is Mikey Aaronworth, signing off. Furnished by Sad Styles Productions. Get into it!